Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Karen Biza, and I'm the one that's been sending you all the emails. So um, I'd like to first say thank you for attending and joining us here. Um, I'm really excited that we're able to offer this mentor summit this year at DockerCon. Um, I work primarily with our meetup organizers in our groups in Asia and Europe. And uh, one of the things that we have done in the last year and a half is um, help newcomers and those intermediate users of Docker uh, learn and continue to learn. So, let's see. Nope. Okay, my computer's freezing. Let's see, maybe this will work. Okay, great. So um, hopefully you all are a part of your local meetup community. Um, we have over 287 meetup groups so far worldwide um, in 80 countries, and um, that's over 170,000 members. Um, that group also includes about 500 organizers, and there are a few of you uh, in the audience today that uh, work tirelessly to provide events and great opportunities for people who are interested in learning Docker of, of all levels. And the reason why I bring this up is because we started uh, doing a couple of global event series with, with, the, with two goals. One is to help newcomers and intermediate users learn about Docker. And the second reason is the uh, goal of engaging more advanced users. And that's where mentorship comes into play. So a while back, um, we also host organizer summits. And uh, the feedback they were sharing with us is that we have a really large group of newcomers. And we also have a, a good core group of more advanced users. And we wanted to come up with different ways to engage both groups. So um, our idea transformed into hosting training events and kind of celebration with our birthdays. And also, uh, we did a mentor week in November. Um, so the mentors were invited to join the mentor group online. And they were also invited to attend the in-person events to help uh, those working through the training materials um, answer any questions or provide feedback. So again, part of uh, engaging mentors online. We have a really great uh, Docker community online, and I encourage all of you to join if you haven't already. Uh, the goal for this group is to make sure everybody is informed and engaged and um, is up to date on the latest news and um, learning opportunities that we have to offer. Uh, within the Docker community, uh, like I mentioned, we have the mentor group. And so right now we have over 900 mentors. And so far, primarily communication within that group has uh, been limited to uh, mentorship opportunities around the in-person event series. Uh, but now, since we're growing and uh, we're now able to offer more opportunities, more ways that um, a wide variety of user levels can mentor and can get involved in the community, um, including working with students, which you'll hear about a little bit later, uh, contributing code, and so forth. So um, the Mentor Summit this year is part of that kind of expansion. So I really highly encourage all of you to join the mentor group online. I know I've said it in a few emails. There are some cards outside. Um, that's really the great best way to stay up to date in um, actionable ways that you can get involved uh, as a mentor in the Docker community. So with that kind of little bit of background information, um, we have some really great speakers for you here today. Um, Anna first is gonna kick us off and uh, talk about what it means to be a good mentor and um, more or less how to be a great one. Uh, we have Sebastian from our open source team who will talk more about contributing to open source. We'll take a quick break, uh, and then we have Jerome, which will go over, give kind of a workshop presentation on the highlights uh, from DockerCon this year. Um, one of the ways that you can get involved in your local community is by doing a uh, DockerCon recap talk at one of your local events. So he's gonna kind of work through all the highlights, and hopefully you'll walk away feeling confident to um, speak and give a presentation in your local community. And then Lisa will end with a short presentation on our Campus Ambassadors Program, which is uh, new, just started a few months ago. And um, we're really excited to be kind of expanding our reach into working with students. And again, that's gonna be one of the, the best ways that you can get involved as a mentor in our community. So I know she's looking forward to telling you more about that. So with that, I'd like to welcome up 
Anna to the stage. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, hello everyone, I hope you've been enjoying DockerCon so far. This is my second year attending and speaking at DockerCon and I'm really thankful that I get to be here. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Karen, Jenny and Victor who made it possible for me to be here and who invited me to speak here. Um, and thank you so much for all of you for coming here and being interested in the Docker Mentor Summit. A little bit about me first. Um, I'm from Germany. I have a non-traditional background. I actually have a degree in English and Catholic theology. That's why you see Shakespeare and Pope Francis there. Um, but about three years ago, I started learning Python, and um, I got involved in the Python and Django communities. And I currently work as the community and operations manager of Django REST framework. Uh, in my free time, I'm involved in a few other tech-related things. I'm PyCon US Open Spaces Chair, I'm DjangoCon US Diversity Chair, and I'm one of the leaders of the PyLadies Remote Group, which is a mentoring program within the Python community. And I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Um, since you're here at DockerCon at the Mentor Summit, I assume that all of you have some sort of interest in mentorship. And before I start, I just want to run a quick informal survey. Who of you has mentored someone? Okay, that's pretty much almost everyone. Who of you have had mentors? Okay. Awesome. Okay, so let's get started. As I mentioned, I'm an English major. I love definitions. So I pulled up the Merriam-Webster dictionary and I looked up what does the word mentor even mean. And the dictionary says that a mentor is someone who teaches or gives help and advice to a less experienced and often younger person, or that a mentor is a trusted counselor or guide. Um, and that definition isn't perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, I don't think that you have to be, that you have to necessarily mentor a younger person. You can mentor someone who's older than you. You can mentor someone who's more advanced than you. Um, so now we know what a mentor is, but why do people need mentors? Think about any situation where you learned something new, whether there was a new programming language, a new sport, a new instrument, just anything new. There probably was a moment when you get stuck and all of a sudden you have this big mountain in front of you and you have no idea how to overcome it. And when you get stuck, you have two options. You can either give up and say, call it quits, or you can get help. And I just want to stress that giving up is not failure. Sometimes giving up is re actually a really smart choice. But let's say that you're learning this thing and you're positive that you can make it, but you just need a little bit of help. You just need someone to help you climb that mountain. So that's when a mentor comes in. And um, just keep in mind that it takes a little bit of courage and effort to reach out to a mentor and to say, hey, I need help. Um, but that's actually the beginning of a new success story. So if you ever need help, don't be ashamed of admitting that you need help. It's actually a pretty strong move to ask for help. It brings you one step closer to your goal. So what's a mentor's job? A mentor's job is to lend a hand, be a guide, be an ally, help someone climb that mountain, go on a mission with someone. Share your knowledge and help someone else succeed. Help someone set career goals, help someone with business decisions, help someone with some work challenges they might be um, overcoming or other frustrations at work. There's a million ways you can help as a mentor. But why should you become a mentor? Why should, some, why should you help someone? Why should you take that time to do that? And for me, the answer to that question is pretty obvious because helping others succeed is one of the best feelings in the world. 
Um, when I started out in the Python community, there were a lot of people that helped me. And without them, I probably wouldn't be standing here and talking to you today. And if you think of your own story and tech or other learning experiences, there were probably people who helped you too. You might not have called them mentors, but secretly they were. Um, and you should always give back at least as much as you have received. So if you've received mentorship in the past, consider paying it forward. You may say, okay, cool, Anna, but really tell me, what's in it for me? Why should I do this? Um, not only is mentoring super fun and rewarding, you'll also learn a ton, you'll gain great teaching skills, you will learn how to think from someone else's perspective, you will gain empathy and patience, um, you'll be able to use these skills in other areas of your life as well. When you take the time to develop a strong mentorship relationship, you will get access to a wealth of knowledge. But you also might end up with a like, lifelong friend or business partner, partner. There really is no downside. And just remember, it's a two-way street. There's reciprocity there. You both can offer something to each other. Mentorship is an incredibly fulfilling experience, and mentors learn at least as much as they teach. And if you think about it from an open source perspective, leading projects on your own isn't very sustainable. So I believe that mentorship is actually the future of open source. We need to teach newcomers how it's done so they can take over and help us. There are a few big myths about mentorship which I noticed that keep people from becoming mentors. So I just want to get those out of the way. Um, one of them, which I think is the biggest one, is that you have to be an expert to be a good mentor, and this is not true. You don't have to be an expert, you just have to have gone through the same struggles as your mentee. Um, I'll give you an example. So I started learning English in fifth grade. In seventh or eighth grade, I was tutoring other students. Was I, was I significantly more experienced than they were? No. I had just gone through the same struggles. And now, 10 years later, I have gone through 10 years of English education, I have a degree in English, I spent a year in the United States, and by no means am I an English expert right now, but I'm further away from those students' struggles. So it's a little bit harder for me right now to understand their grammar questions. Myth number two is that only in-person mentoring is good mentoring. And that's not true. You don't have to meet at the same coffee shop every week in order to have a good mentor-mentee relationship. Remote and online mentoring works just as fine. I'll give you another example. A good friend of mine lives in Madison, Wisconsin. I live in Germany, so there's a huge physical distance, but there's also a seven-hour time difference. And we still make it work and meet every Wednesday online for an hour and we chat and he mentors me. In-person mentoring is great, but remote mentoring works just as fine, which is why all of you should get involved in the online opportunities that Docker offers. And myth number three is that mentoring takes up a ton of time. I feel like that's why people shy away from it, because they think it's too much of a commitment, they don't have the time to do it. And that also isn't true if you do it the right way. Like I said, what works for me is setting up a weekly office hour. That's just one hour a week. All of you have an hour a week to help someone, I would assume. The advantage of having an office hour is you know both are free at that set time and me as a mentee I can ask my mentor all my questions during that one hour and I don't feel the need to write an email every day for example. And the last one is that only newbies need mentors. And that isn't true either. There is constantly something new to learn, especially in technology, there's always, there's always something new that pops up and you never know it all. Sometimes it's good to just get a second opinion or advice. As humans, we're always learning, we're all evolving, we never know it all. So ideally, you should always play both roles. Mentors can have mentors as well. If you're a mentor, it's okay if you ask for help too. Um, ideally, you should never fully transition from mentor to mentee. You should always play both roles. We should always be learning from each other and also teaching at the same time. And I just want to stress one more thing. Remember that there's a difference between being a mentor and a tutor. 
Tutors are people that get paid to help you prepare for tests or improve your skills. I got paid to be an English tutor for many years. But as a mentor, it's more of an, in, it's more of an informal peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Just be friends. Try to figure out what you can learn from each other. Supplement each other's skill gaps. Remember that it's supposed to be a fun growth experience. And the key to success of any mentorship relationship is really just um, defining goals and making it an open dialogue from the beginning on. Before you start mentoring, you should have a conversation and answer these questions. What are your goals? What do you want to work on together? What will the time commitment be? And how are you going to communicate? I'll give you an example again with my friend Ian. So when we started my mentorship journey, we figured out that my goal was to learn more about REST APIs at that point, and we picked a project to work on together. And we figured out that the time commitment would be one hour a week. And we've determined that communication via Slack and email would work best for us. Some weeks I also send him an email or ping him in Slack if I messed up something with Git and GitHub again um, outside of our um, office hour, but usually one hour a week works really great. Let's take a look at the do's and don'ts of mentorship next. What are things you should do as a mentor and what are things you shouldn't do? Don't assume, just ask. Ask how you can help. Find out what kind of help your mentee needs. Do they need the solution to a programming problem? Do they need guidance? Do they just need an explanation? Maybe they just need advice. It's also important to not assume knowledge in certain areas. Instead, just ask, hey, do you know this and this? This will not only make your mentee 100% more comfortable, this will also make your life as a mentor a lot easier. Learn to ask the right questions to figure out what your mentee doesn't understand. Oftentimes, people feel insecure to admit if they don't know something. So by asking them, you give them the opportunity to say, I don't know, and you make them feel comfortable about it. I'll give you an example that recently happened to me. So I was walking through the expo hall at DockerCon, and one of the sponsors had this thing set up that you had to sign into your GitHub account and start one of their repositories, and then you would get some swag. Um, and that lady assumed that I don't have a GitHub account, which might be offensive to some people. Instead, she could have just asked, hey, do you have a GitHub account? And I could have said, yes, I do. But I also could have said, no, I don't. And then she could have set, followed up with, hey, let me help you set one up. So do you see what I'm trying to say? Just ask people, don't make assumptions. Which leads us to the next point. Show your flaws. Dethrone yourself. Show your mentee that you're just a normal person too. You may, in tech, we, all, we often have this rock star culture where you may, some of you may think that Jerome is a rock star because he's really famous and he's an awesome person, but he's also just a normal human. Um, I know that I had some people in the Python community that I was actually scared to talk to because to me they were these rock stars and then you talk to them and they notice they're just normal people. So just act as a normal hu human, dethrone yourself. People don't sympathize with perfect, they sympathize with flawed. Um, my English student probably asked, used to ask me 10 times um, during our mentoring hour, what does this and this word mean? And uh, English actually has four times more vocabulary gen than German does, so I don't know all the words. So I took out my iPad or my iPhone in front of her, and I did that on purpose to show her that there are things that I don't know as well. I wanted to show her that I'm not perfect. And I also showed her just to pull up a dictionary app and look it up. Also, it takes a ton of pressure off of you if you admit that you don't know something. Um, some of you may have heard that saying the best teachers to, don't tell you, tell you where to look, but don't tell you what to see. You don't have to know everything, you just have to know where to look it up or who to ask. Um, and it takes a while to get comfortable with someone that you don't know very well, but um, when you show your flaws, it gets easier. Ideally, you should be a me uh, your mentee should be able to let, your, let their guard down with you and ask those stupid questions that we all have. 
as I, should, as I said earlier, you should always play both roles, always be a mentor and a mentee at the same time. Ask questions, remember that there are no stupid questions. Be open to learning from your mentee as well. Keep in mind that it's a two-way street. Figure out what you can teach each other and what you can learn from each other. Listen. One of your jobs as a mentor is to provide advice and encouragement, but in order to do so, you first need to figure out what kind of help your mentee needs. Listen more than you speak. Um, figure out what exactly they're struggling with. Sometimes being a rubber duck, sometimes listening means being a rubber duck. Some of you may have heard of the concept of rubber duck debugging. For those of you who don't know what it is, I'll just explain it real quick. So the concept is you run into a programming problem and you have a little rubber duck sitting on your desk. There was actually one of the sponsors who gave away rubber ducks. I hope you all grabbed one. And you explain your problem to the rubber duck. And you may think, oh, this is kind of creepy or stupid, but it actually works. Because by speaking out loud, you're forced to explain your problem and either the solution will pop into your mind right away or you're at least able to phrase it in more precise words and then you can post your question in stack or on Stack Overflow in one sentence instead of maybe a five, um, five paragraphs or something like that. Um, and sometimes, as a mentor, it's your job to just be that rubber duck. Just let your mentee explain problems to you and try to listen to them. Which leads us to the next point. Be committed and available. And this doesn't mean that you have to be available 24-7. That's not realistic. Sometimes that just means sitting next to someone. Sometimes that just means being online in Slack, which, which takes no effort at all. I'll give you another example. When I was in elementary school, my grandfather um, used to always sit next to me when I did my homework. And I didn't really need his help, but his, he would just sit there and read his newspaper. And just his presence gave me enough confidence to finish my homework on my own. And sometimes that's all someone needs. When I mentor at workshops, for example, sometimes someone just needs the reassurance that they, the command they're typing in is the right one. Sometimes you just need to sit there and reassure someone. Um, mentorship is a commitment but how much time you want to spend on it is totally up to you. Your mentee should be the driving force and you should be the passenger and together you'll decide how fast or slow you want to move. Show empathy, be patient, be open-minded, be kind. Don't get upset if your mentee if you have to explain something to your mentee a couple of times. Different people need different kinds of explanations. Try to remember how hard things were for you when you started out. Take enough breaks, don't overdo it, cut your mentee lots of slack. We're all just humans, not machines. Always be positive and encouraging. Believe in your mentee and show them that you do. Um, sometimes we need for someone to believe in us first before we believe in ourselves. I remember about three years ago I gave my first ever conference talk and I was so nervous and shaky, but I had some friends at the conference with me and they believed in me that I would do a good job. And if it hadn't been for them, I probably wouldn't have gone up on stage. Um, learning consists of a lot of ups and downs, and if your mentee's down, then you lift them up. Help them climb that mountain. Tell them repeatedly if they're doing something well. Tell them that they're awesome. Tell them that they can do it. Be proud of them. Encourage them to be kind to themselves, too. And this one's very important. Words are powerful. Words can destroy a person's self-esteem and self-confidence and totally discourage them. Phrase things carefully. Apologize if you phrase something poorly. It happens to all of us, but it's just important to recognize your mistakes and try to do better. Um, I'll give you an example, which is a little weird maybe. So yesterday I took a break and I went over to Starbucks and I got that new unicorn frappuccino that everyone's talking about. And I posted a picture on Twitter and I said something like, take a break from DockerCon drinking my unicorn frappuccino. And someone tweeted back at me and he said, does it come with insulin? Hashtag diabetes ops. And to him, that was a joke, but to me it was actually very offensive. So try to keep in mind that something that's funny to you might not be funny to someone else and try to choose your words wisely. Also, never tell someone that they failed. 
The word failure is such a strong and destructive word that I don't think we need to use that. And finally, um, don't touch your mentee's screen or keyboard. I know it's tempting and a lot of people just go like, hey, let me type that in for you, but it's actually very rude. Um, stay patient. It may take a little longer if you let them do it, but that's how they learn. You don't want for someone else to grab your screen and have fingerprints all over your laptop, right? So don't do that to someone else, please. Um, there are certain tools you can use when you mentor someone. Some of those may sound trivial or obvious, but I just wanted to mention them anyway. Um, here's a selection of tools that I like to use. Slack works great for communication online, and it's, you have to remember that it's much easier to set up Slack than IRC. IRC is something I really struggled with when I started programming. Um, email, I know we all hate email because we get to many of them, but if you need a quick answer to a quick question, it works great. Skype or Google Hangouts for a real-time conversation or screen sharing. Um, Cloud9 is a great online IDE. It's not the best IDE out there, but it lets you collaborate and see code and work on code at the same time, and it's also free. And Pastebin or Gist may sound trivial, but when I started coding, I had no idea how to share my code other than taking a screenshot. Um, just figure out what works best for the two of you. And besides these technical tools, there are also a few non-technical tools like patience, a good attitude, a smile, friendliness, and empathy that you will need. You may not think this all sounds awesome. I really want to become a mentor but you don't know where and how you can get involved. Sebastian is going to give a really awesome talk on mentorship in the Docker community, and since he knows more, much more about that than I do, um, I'll leave that topic to him. But if you're looking to mentor outside of the Docker community, here are a few ways you can get involved. Um, you can coach at a Django Girls workshop. Django Girls is an organization that teaches um, web development to women, and you do not have to be a web development expert or even a Django expert in order to help. They also have a Gitter chat online where you can answer questions. You could teach a class for the Pi Ladies. Um, we also welcome male teachers. Sometimes people think that it's all just women, but no, male teachers are more than welcome. Um, I run PyLadies Remote, and I would actually love to have an introduction to Docker class. So if one of you is interested in teaching one, it's all remote online classes. Please come see me after my talk. Um, you could teach a class for your local girl develop it chapter. They're all over the country. You also may have seen Chick Tech had a booth, booth in the expo hall. They're also nationwide. If you've given a conference talk before, you could work as a speaker mentor. I know that Django Con US encourages speaker mentors. Other uh, conferences may as well. Uh, you can get involved with Code Newbie or Open Hatch. You can help out at local sprints and hackathons or a local user group. You can become a mentor for programs like Google Summer of Code or the Outreach Internship Program. You could simply offer your help to someone at work, a junior engineer or just really anyone. It's always good to know that there is a friendly person that you can ask questions. You could encourage someone to attend a conference or workshop or a meetup with you. That's sometimes really scary when you're a beginner. You could simply tweet that you're willing to help answer questions or watch out on Twitter if someone needs help. Um, the next one's a really great one. You could create a first-timers only issue on GitHub. And these issues are specifically targeted at people wanting to make their first open source contribution. And this is also a great chance for you to help. So you just create an issue, you explain in greater detail than usual what you need done because remember that you're speaking to a newbie and then you offer help, and then you tag it with first-timers only so people can find it. If you're an open source maintainer, just put a little bit, put a sentence or two in your readme that you're willing to help someone with pull requests and that you're open to answering questions. There are so many ways you can help out. If none of those work for you, but you still would like to help, please come see me after my talk. I'm sure we can figure something out. Um, and I just thought of this today, what, why, 
don't we just start selling like darker ladies? You may have, darker con has improved immensely with the attendance of women. I think this year it was 20% if I saw correctly on Twitter, but um, there we can still do better. So I just I'm just throwing this idea out there that we should start something like darker ladies to get even more awesome ladies involved in the darker community. Um, some of you might not only seek to become a mentor, they might be looking for a mentor. So how do you find a mentor? If you notice, mentors don't walk around with name tags. Most people don't call themselves mentors. I can only tell you how, how I find, found my mentors, and that was by attending conferences and meetups and just asking people questions. Approach someone with a concrete problem or question. Don't just walk up to someone and ask them, hey, will you be my mentor? That's all a bit weird. Um, and if you find someone who's passionate about something, they're usually pretty open to helping you out. All of you are passionate about Docker, I assume, so I'm, I'm sure that all of you would be more than willing to teach someone Docker. Don't be shy, just walk up to someone, help someone, and if you're looking for a mentor but you don't know how to approach that problem, come and see me after my talk. I'm sure we can figure something out. So who of you is going to become a mentor now? Hope all of you. Um, one more thing, I talked about PyLadies Remote a little bit. It's a mentoring group for women in the Python space. We do one class a month, it's all remote screencasts. Um, we, like I said, we welcome male teachers as well, and if you're ever interested in teaching a class for us, it doesn't have to be Python related. As I mentioned, I would really like to have something like um, Docker one-on-one -on -one or Introduction to Docker. If one of you is interested, please come see me. You can also follow us on Twitter at, at PyLadies Remote. And if you go to our website, you can find a list of resources of previous classes, which is actually a great teaching resource as well if one of your um, mentees needs that kind of help. I also brought some stickers with our logo, so if you'd like a sticker, please come find me as well um, after my talk, and I'd love to give one to you. Um, that's all I have for you today. I think I have some time to answer questions. You can also tweet me later if you like. I'm at OSSAnna16 on Twitter, or you can come see me at my talk after my talk. I'll be around all day. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being here and for being interested in mentorship. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the Mentorship Summit. Thank you. So we definitely have a little bit of time for question and answers. Um, so I can pass around the mic if any of you have any questions right now for Anna. No, not yet. Sorry. That's okay. I can do it. I just you asked for them in Slack, and so I put it in there, and I was like, uh, "Am I supposed to raise my hand or not?" Uh, I was just curious about any concrete tips you might have for doing online mentoring. I've, I've done a lot of mentoring in person, but online mentoring seems like it would be really hard. So if, are there tools that work well? Uh, just specific advice for the online part of it. Um, it depends on what you want to work on. Are you trying to work on a project with someone or are you just answering questions just in general or what do you mean? Well, I'm, to, to use an example, so I'm, I'm a member of the PHP channel on Freenode. I've been there for almost 18 years. And people come in and they ask a question and they leave. And I have no idea if they were successful. I have no idea if we helped them or not. I'm just wondering if there's a way to turn those into more long-term relationships where we can see the people evolve and, and get them more engaged on a one-to-one -to -one basis. What if you set up a, an IRC channel just for mentoring or a Slack channel just for mentoring? I have with my mentor that I, I was talking about online, we specifically have a Slack channel just for us, where I, and Slack is pretty great. I can post a question today, he can answer whenever. So Slack works really great. Um, like I said, Google Hang, just hopping on a Google Hangout works great, or putting, you, well, it's difficult. It depends on the kind of help that person needs. But just in general, set up a Slack instance so you can stay in touch with that person. Or just ask them for their email address. Ask them if they would want to pop on a Hangout with you. Um, Cloud9 works really great if you're trying to debug something. Or maybe just ask them to put up their code on GitHub where you can um, work on that together. I think there is a ton of opportunities. It's just that you need the other person to also be willing to commit to that relationship. 
It's a mentorship shouldn't be like something like Stack Overflow where you, where you just ask a question, you get an answer, and then you're done. It should be an ongoing relationship. And also just uh, a little bit more specific to the Docker community. We have the Docker community Slack, and we have all different channels of different topics. Um, so that's also another way that you can mentor online. And a lot of times people will go in kind of like a direct message conversation and kind of work through the problem. Um, Slack also has calling now too, so if that's even easier to get in a quick call, I know a few people have done that before. I do that a lot to communicate with my organizers. Um, it works really well. And we also, um, with the global event series, because they happen around the clock worldwide, um, we often encourage remote mentors to kind of pop on the um, whatever assigned channel we have to them to answer any questions um, remotely, and that, that tends to work out really well uh, too. Thank you. Um, do you have any specific uh, recommendations around, like, if you're trying to do mentorship to younger kids, school kids, who, where you know the parents or the kids might not feel comfortable going online or into Slack channels, or how do you gain trust, trust, and set something like that up? Okay, I'm just going to repeat the question. The question is, how do you get more younger kids involved? How do you spark their interest? Raspberry Pis is a great way. Um, I know there is a program that PyCon does every year where they teach the kids, I think Minecraft on the Raspberry Pi. Just pick a topic that kids are interested in. Minecraft is pretty great. I know Alex Ellis does a lot of cool stuff with the Raspberry Pi. Um, there's a conference in Nashville that I attend every year and they give each kid a Chromebook. Chromebooks are very cheap and usually you can find someone to sponsor that. And go, the, go where the kids are. Don't try to get them to come to you, like go into local schools or um, learning centers or something like that and do something that um, attracts kids. I know for adults, always like giving free stuff away or great food works for kids. It might be games or free computers or something. Just give them an incentive to come and work on something with them that they might be interested in. I, I have a mentor and a mentee who's Russian and then I also have hearing issues. Sometimes there's issues with communication and understanding um, the point that each other's trying to get across. Do you have any advice for that? How do you usually communicate? Do you do video calls or is it text-based or what do you do? Um, both in person and um, over email and chat. Okay. Um, I, I don't really. What if you just got someone like a translator or someone who also knows Russian who can maybe help out with the problem. Language barrier is definitely a problem, but I don't know how to solve that in a good way. So just a translator, someone else in the community who might know Russian and English well and who can kind of work as a mediator maybe. Anybody else? Okay, great. And uh, again, if you do have any kind of follow-up questions or you think of something later, uh, feel free to reach out to Anna directly um, through Twitter. And you can pop the, chan the, the question in the Mentor Summit channel um, as well. I'm also in the Slack channel. My name, username is just Anna. So you can find me there too. There it is. Now it works. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Sebastian. Um, better known as the Jesta on GitHub, and a lot of people may have seen me on GitHub. Um, <laughs> I see some familiar faces here, so that's cool. I'm going to talk a bit about contributing to open source uh, for the Docker projects, and now the Mobi projects as well. I haven't adopted yet for that, but I'll try to just go through it. Um, about me. I'm a, I was a PHP developer before I joined Docker. I started to help out on the projects around version 0.5, so fairly early days. And currently, I'm a curator, a maintainer uh, for the Docker open source projects. Contributing. 
in all possible ways, because it's not just code that we're talking about. There are some requirements, and many people think they look something like this, like I have a fairly experienced programmer in Go, a uh, master degree in all kinds of things, uh, fluent in English. Uh, I've been running Docker in production for six years, so there's one that qualifies. <laughs> Uh, but in practice, it's not that difficult because there's many ways to contribute and most of those ways don't really need a lot of experience. It's just being there and that's what I want to talk about. So what are the requirements? I think the basic communication skills in English are fairly good to have, but you can use Google Translate. I know some people do. And sometimes we even have to do it the other way. Um, you're willing to help out others because it's contributing in many ways. And you have used Docker. Because if you are a Docker user, you know of many things that people go through. You see things, you see things missing. You've been reading the documentation and you think, that doesn't really fit with what I was expecting. I'm missing something or I don't know. Uh, I have this experience, and maybe other people don't have the experience. So that's why I want to talk about the ways to contribute. Um, there's many ways, as I said, and it's not all in the code or actually changing things. It can be simply reporting issues on GitHub. I mean, you've been running into an issue you think it doesn't work as you expect it to be, or you think it can use some enhancements. If you open an issue, uh, first try to find if there is already an issue for it, because we have quite a lot of them. Um, that helps. And especially if you add your use case to it, because we have people reporting, we want feature X, Y, or Z, and we need it now. But it's not really clear what they're trying to you to do. And there may be different ways to do it. And if you open an issue and you describe, this is my use case, and these are the steps I'm currently doing to achieve this with Docker, then we can think along. And the maintainers may see, oh, maybe there's a way to improve this. Or maybe, have you tried this the other way? And that's something that's often missing. So we return to that later on. Um, also, read other users' issues. Um, people open issues, and maybe you ran into the same situation, and you think, oh, I have a solution for that. Have you tried this? Because it's not, not only the maintainers doing that, it's basically everyone can do, uh, can do those steps. You can open an account on GitHub, comments there, help other people using Docker, or help clarifying them. Other ways to contribute, um, improving the documentation. I'll come back to that later as well. It's often a first step for people to contribute to Docker because it's quite easy to do so, and we made it even easier recently. If you're more into coding, you can help out do the review. There's pull requests being opened. They need a review. And more eyes is always better. Other ways outside of GitHub, uh, interact with other users on the community Slack or other channels that there are, the forums, uh, Stack Overflow. You may have experience, other people may not have that, or just a nice chat to, feel, to make people feel at home or to direct them to the right people. A bit about the project. And I put it like this in descending order of importance. First of all, contributors. I think those are more important than the maintainers and everything below. Um, the contributors, especially first time people, I think are very important. It takes a lot of courage to open your first pull request or to start adding to the project. Curators. Um, 
That's a role we invented, and basically it started out with me. I was a user of Docker, and I started contributing by reading all the issues, and I had zero knowledge about Docker or anything below what, it, what it's doing. So I started learning from the project by reading the issues, and at some point I knew about other issues that were open. I could connect them, or I could say, this is a duplicate, or have you looked at the other issue, or it's being worked on? And curators do our issue triage. I'm going back on that as well in some later slides. Then there's the maintainers. Ba maintainers are basically the housekeepers of the project. The most important part of being a maintainer is that you're the constant factor. We know that the maintainers are around. They're not moving away after a month or so. So you know there's continuity in the project. Um, maintainers can be employed by Docker. Many of them are not employed by Docker, or maybe weren't employed by Docker, but became a Docker employee. And we have certain rules uh, how we select those maintainers. Uh, there's a link here, but I can explain it, that basically we look at activity on a repository, see how people contribute to the project, and if we identify people that have been active for several months, um, we know they are a constant factor in the project. And at some point we may start a vote, and all the maintainers can vote if they agree on having that person added. And if they do, a person gets added as a maintainer. And maintainers have to follow the same rules. We have a set of rules, uh, like if you want to merge a PR, it has to get two LGTMs for, from other maintainers. LGTM is looks good to me. So they reviewed the PR. They said, it looks okay. We can merge it now. And maintainers never push directly to master or any branch. It's always through a pull request, and it goes the same process as for everyone else. Documentation. Yeah, documentation is, for many people, an easy way to get started. Um, I can open the docs. if the connection is doing it. There we go. And in a recent change, um, there has been added some buttons to the documentation itself. And on every page, you will find an edit this page button and a request doc changes. What that will do is the first button will automatically open the file on GitHub, open it in an editor, and you can make the changes that you think are needed, open the pull request, and within no time, after some review, you can get it merged. So even without knowledge about Git or really about GitHub, you can start contributing. So for first time users, it's a great way to get started. If you're not comfortable with making the change yourself and you see something that you think needs a rewrite, you can request changes that will open a new issue on the docs repository and you can describe what you think needs changing. If you have an issue with the documentation and it's more general, so not a specific page, you can always open an issue on the GitHub repository itself and describe what you think needs changing. And that could also mean that you think, maybe we need a new section to the documentation because we have some reference or we have something describing a feature of Docker. And it could be that you think, okay, this needs some use cases that are not described, and I know of this feature, but it's, I don't understand how it works. You can open an issue, and that way make uh, the docs team aware of it. 
And either they can ask you, maybe you want to work on it yourself, or one of the docs team is going to work on it. And the same applies to any pull request, because we have uh, several tech writers at Docker, and they're always there to assist you getting your PR in a merchable state. And sometimes they add some commits to your pull request to fix up some minor issues to make it easier for you to get your PR merged. This is basically what I was saying. So if you have feedback on the documentation, it's important to tell so. Um, especially for the engineers and people at Docker. We're working with Docker all the time, and it's easy to overlook things you run into as a beginning user or as a daily user, but in a different use case. So all feedback is welcome, and it's a way to contribute. If you want to work on the docs and you don't have something you found yourself, you can look through the issues on GitHub as well, because other people may have pressed that feedback, feedback button. <laughs> Sorry. And you can pick those up. They currently have a hackathon going on, and they labeled all the issues with a hackathon and uh, experience levels, and you can look at those issues and work on them. And you can get nice gifts as well, <laughs> if I understand. Um, if you want to interact with the docs team, they're on the community Slack as well, and I think it's in the docs channel or documentation. I forgot, but um, so if you want to directly interact with them, do so. They're there to answer your questions. I was talking about the curators, and curators do the issue triage. And it's an important job, and it's something we can never have enough people on. What is triage, and what procedures do we follow? First of all, uh, triage is a big part of triage is getting the right information. People report an issue, uh, forget to mention the exact things they encountered, didn't mention the, the version of Docker they were using. Um, so getting the right information is important. Finding duplicates, because people don't always search the GitHub issues, and it's not the best search engine around, so they may issue a duplicate. So if you know there is another issue, you can leave a comment and say this is probably a duplicate of the other issue. And a maintainer can close the issue. Or at some point, if you are officially uh, a curator, you may have write access and close the issue yourself. Curators also label issues. And I'll show the list of labels in a bit. Um, and in general, triaging is adding metadata. So more information to the issue to make it easier to find, easier to resolve, and make sure it's actionable. In the repository, we have several documents describing the processes we follow. One of them is the triage process for issues. It describes what information is required to open an issue if you file a bug report, like the Docker version and Docker info, because it contains a lot of valuable information for the maintainers to know what they should be looking into. You need to classify the issue. Is it a bug? Is it a feature request? Is it an enhancement? Maybe it's a question. And Questions are not really intended to be put on GitHub, but we tend to not close them directly because people find them through, through Google or whatever means. So if you just close them, people arrive there and don't find the answer. So what we usually do is provide a short answer, but still point the people to the forums or Stack Overflow 
or the community Slack to get the information they were asking for. What area is the issue in? Is it an API issue? Is it something with Docker build? Or is it the daemon that crashes? Or maybe it's a documentation issue? We have several area labels that allow us to better find the issues or to group them or assign them to the right people. The platform is important. Uh, Docker running on Windows do, uses completely different mechanisms than Docker on Linux. And sometimes there's a different architecture. And for example, the Power and Z systems are uh, largely contributed by the IBM people. Uh, so if we label them, we can find the IBM people to have a look at them. And if there's a bug and you think, okay, this one is easy to resolve, or maybe difficult, we apply an experience level to it. So people that want to contribute to Docker can find those issues, find one in their, with their experience level, and start working on it. And the final two parts is a status. So if we were able to reproduce an issue, we can say it's confirmed. If it's a feature request and we think it's a great idea, but don't have the time to work on it, we can add a status accepted that we can tell uh, other people to start working on it is fine. And more info needed is usually either if someone didn't provide all the information or we suspect the issue has been resolved, but we want to have that feedback from the user to confirm it's resolved for them as well. And then there's a needs attention, and that's usually if there's an issue or a pull request that needs more eyes. And if a maintainer or a curator applies that label, uh, we have a weekly meetup with the maintainers. It's a hangout, and I can add those issues or those PRs to that session to talk about them with other people. And the last section is priorities. And that is, is used uh, for high priority issues that may be a reason to issue a patch release of Docker. We, we've had cases where there was a kernel panic or a, a, sorry, a panic in the Docker daemon that many people could run into. So usually that's an issue that needs to be worked on as soon as possible and we will release a patch release because of that. Besides labeling ourselves, we also have a couple of bots running. They try to identify the issue by looking at the text that's in the comment that's opened. And based on that, applies to the correct area that it was uh, found in or the kind of issue. And it also labels all the issues with the version of Docker it was reported with. So if you think you want to get started on triaging, um, when can you do so and how can you do so? Basically any time. Any person can already help out with the triage. As I mentioned before, you can ask for more information. You can see an issue and think it's a duplicate. And commenting on GitHub is possible for every, everyone, so you don't need special permissions. And if you do so for a while, or you contact me and you say, I want to do this more, we can add you as an official curator to the repository. You can get the right access so that you can edit comments or add the information and the labels and help us out that way. An easy way to get started also is the more info needed label because we apply those labels and we should be revisiting them. <laughs> uh, many cases we don't always follow up, so we need to check if they are still 
missing information or maybe the issue can be closed if the original reporter never responded back after a while we just closed them some more practical examples um, well the issue tracker is not a support forum and many people see it as it as it is and although we try to answer the questions it's taking a lot of time so if possible if we see an issue that's being opened and really is a support issue, not, not a bug report, point the person to the right locations to report their issue or to, to discuss what they want to discuss. And you can do so uh, without being a curator officially, just comment and point them to the right location and ask the original reporter to close, to close the issue. Um, this is if you are a curator, because we have many cases where issues are opened by mistake, because apparently GitHub has a shortcut and it's the C for create an issue. So if you are on the issue overview page and you type Docker, enter, it will create a new issue for you. So we have a lot, a lot of issues like this, like this, Curhub, and we know what's happening. Then uh, one of the least favorable things to do is lock an issue. Um, we have issues and we, most of the time we leave the discussion, the, the, the discussion open for commenting so that other people can interact with the people that reported the issue. Uh, sometimes an issue is still open and people start to report all kinds of non-related issues on that. So part of triage is also locking down an issue. That's not always fun to do. Um, but in cases where we do so, we try to at least give a summary of why we locked the issue. I've taken an example here because this, this was an issue attracting a lot of comments, non-related issues, and nobody knew what it was about anymore. So I summarized all the issues that were mentioned, linked them to related issues that were still there or still open or being looked into or solutions that were there. And after that, I locked the discussion. I think it's, it's the best way to do so. If you just lock the issue, you get a lot of people ranting, why was this locked? And you're pulling your power now to lock us out and that doesn't work. They open, open, they only open new issues instead, and that doesn't work. Also, a good thing is to check if people report it in the right location. Uh, there are several products, and some of those products, Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, have their own issue tracker. And although they use the same technology behind it, there is a UI and different tooling around it that has a different team. So pointing them to the right issue tracker helps because that way at least the right people are looking at it. And of course we had a confusion about swarm and swarm mode, which was difficult to handle. <laughs> so we point people to the swarm issue tracker if they are using standalone swarm instead of swarm mode. And as mentioned before as well, Docker version and Docker info provide a lot of useful information and some people don't understand why. Uh, but the point is there's various versions of Docker. There's also versions of Docker that were not built by Docker and have patches. And sometimes the issue is related to those patches and we cannot help the people because we don't have those patches. And it's useful to check if they're running the standard kernel version for the dist distro. It's a bit more technical, but we had cases that people ran their custom kernel on top of a regular distro and had all kinds of issues there. And we were looking into it for weeks and then finally asked, okay, maybe you can provide your Docker info. Have you tried the regular kernel? And the issue was resolved.
and feature requests, like I mentioned earlier as well, if you open a feature request, it's useful to have the use case. So if you see a person opening a feature request and only saying, I want this feature, ask them why they need it and if they can provide some use cases or the way they are using it. So even if you're not the original reporter of the issue, trying to ask the person that did to add that information. Ask them, maybe provide some examples or more information. Or maybe it's the technology you're using yourself and you have some additional use cases that you think is useful. Always add it. Okay, the final bit. It's the thing most people think about when contributing and that's code review and contributing actual code. We have processes for that as well. And again, the bots play a role. There's a number of, of labels we, we're using for the process. If a pull request is opened, it first ends up in triage. It's the first step in the review pro process. If it's in triage, one of the maintainers has to move it to an appropri appropriate stage, which can be either design review, if it's a user-facing user change, or it can go directly to, to code review if it's a bug fix. During code review, all the maintainers and contributors can review the PR, and if they give them two thumbs up, we can move it to the next step. And by applying those labels, every maintainer knows what step is needed at that, at that point. It may be that there's docs changes needed after the code has been approved, or it could even be that during docs review, some maintainer says, this doesn't look right. We need to go back to design review. At that point, they can move it back. Uh, and we can keep track of all the PRs in what stage they are. And finally, if the PR is about to be merged, we apply impact labels. Those help us to compose the change log for each release and to make the documentation team aware that additional doc, doc changes may be needed and make it, makes it easier to find what PRs actually affected the, the user interface changes. And last but not least is during our release process, we have a couple of labels that we use to cherry pick PRs into a release branch, merge it back or do several steps during the release. So who can do the code review? Well, the, the maintainers obviously do the code review, uh, but anyone can help. Even if you don't have a lot of experience, maybe you see some code smell in the code, even if you're not an experienced Go, Go programmer. When I started out at Docker or started out contributing, I had zero experience with Go. <laughs> I started looking through the PRs, learned from them, and along the way saw some things that I knew, okay, I can help out here. And you learn from it, and it's a lot of fun. You, you, you not only learn about the programming language, but also about Docker itself, how the whole process works how features get into Docker, or maybe didn't get into Docker. Um, as I said, during PR reviews as well, um, it can be that we overlooked a use case. So we think this feature doesn't make sense, but then someone adds the additional information, like it does make sense if you look at it the other way. Um, just that tiny bit of information could help getting a PR merged or rejected. Okay, if you want to contribute code yourself, there's a couple of ways. First of all, bug fixes are always welcome. So if you see an issue being reported that mentions that it's a bug, 
feel free to start wor working on it. If it's a new feature and there was not an accepted label on it, it may be worth to check first with the maintainers if we generally agree on the feature. Many times we leave a feature request open to collect more feedback. So it's not directly that it's still open, that it means that we will accept it. It's also that we are collecting feedback to see if it makes sense. If you think it makes sense and you have all reasons to, um, feel free to ask a maintainer, um, is it okay to work on this? Could be on GitHub or on the community Slack. And if they say, go ahead, by all means, start coding. And it doesn't have to be perfect at first time. Um, we help you during the PR uh, review process to get your PR in a mergeable state. So if, you know, if you're not sure, you can open a PR, uh, make, make known that it's a work in progress and that you're collecting feedback on the PR as well, and we help you out. One thing that is important is to keep your pull requests small. Don't implement a huge feature and dump it over to the repository. It's better to make small changes, which could even be a single line of code. Especially if it's a single line of code, there's one or two maintainers saying it's ready to merge. It's merged within no time. Usually a PR is merged at least within a week sometimes within a couple of hours. If you need more information on contributing code and documentation, we have a section on the documentation as well. It's in the open source contributors guide. That doesn't work. And it, it explains how to set up your machine to start working on code, how the review process works, like I just explained, and all the steps that are needed. You can ping a maintainer on the community Slack, or you can also send an email to the Docker Dev Google group. And for me, that's it for now. Are there any questions? Thank you so much for your talk. I don't know if you mentioned that, but do you label issues also according to difficulty? So if as a newbie I want to contribute, I know this is something I could easily do. Correct, yeah. So um, when we see an issue that is easy to work on, we have the experience levels and we apply those so people can search for those if they want to work on an issue, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Sebastian.